Hi, everyone. Don't start the clock yet. Um, so, hello, New York. How are you all feeling? Okay. Um, in order to kind of get the blood flowing, um, there is someone in the audience called Kevin who has just turned 18. And, um, and so I'd like you all to give him a, uh, a welcome to being a grown-up civic tech <laughs> person. <laughs> He's also a young Rewired State, and I've known him since he was 13, and he now works for us in Rewired State, which is the other thing that I founded. So, um, can we finally have a digital democracy? The answer to that is um, pretty much yes, but as the message that came through yesterday very strongly, we are still dealing with the basics. And I have a notepad with me on stage because actually a lot of the stuff that I'm talking about today, I'm having to kind of keep up with. Things change every day. Right? So I'm having to take notes this morning, just kind of going, what's happening next? So this is what happened to me at the beginning of uh, last year. In January, I received a phone call saying, can you please stand by for the Speaker of the House of Commons? And I was like, okay, <laughs> what have I done? And uh, he came on and he said, Emma Mulqueeny. I didn't even know he knew my name. And he said he would like me to... Um, join him on his um, commission for digital democracy, which, like for me, is the thing that I'm probably most passionate about ever quite dull. And that was my reply. I was just like, it's fine, but I don't want to spend an entire year doing all of the work voluntarily that you're going to require of me so for it to just be a talking shop and end up with nothing, right, other than just a printed report. And so I said yes. And I said yes because of this, right? I'm sure all of you recognize these feelings and this building. Yesterday, I cried twice during the speaker things. I, this stuff still gets me very emotional. I kind of, I, I'm very passionate about um, digital things and about democracy. But throughout the course of the commission, I discovered that I know a lot about digital and not very much about democracy. So I spent a lot of last year learning about it. Now, the other thing I'm going to have to read out to you because I keep forgetting is all of the things that we were actually told to focus on throughout the year because you can imagine that there was so much and it wasn't just the UK that we looked at. We looked at what was happening around the world and we were creating a baseline of what was happening and then what should happen just if we could start at kind of ground zero, right? So we looked at voting, electronic voting, engagement and dialogue, representation, scrutiny, and making laws in a digital age. And Ben Kalos, who may or may not be in the audience now because I'm on a panel with him later, um, got very involved in that one. And one of the questions that kept coming up was, does digital threaten representative democracy? And for me, I think it does. And I'm just going to explain to you why. You can look at the report online. It's called Open Up. Just Google it and you'll find it. I will read out the link later. But I don't want you to focus on the report. I just want you to think about the basics. So this is the main outcome. This is not surprising. This is what everybody was telling us. This is what we heard time and time again. It didn't matter what topic we were doing. All of, you know, everywhere around the world, people were saying this. We care about issues, not politics. Speak in plain English. Stop broadcasting. We want to take part in, pl in Parliament, and we need to understand it in order to do that. We don't have time to read everything, which is difficult because they care about the issues. Go to where people are. We want genuine dialogue, and tell us what's going on. Right? None of that is going to surprise anybody in this room. However, it's very important that we remember this, because this just doesn't change. So it doesn't matter how smart we get, and how many apps and you know, things that we create, and projects that we run. This is what we're trying to solve, and this is difficult. Oh, sorry. Um, for me, have I, am I, am I, I've lost my sound. It's okay, just keep going. <laughs> sorry. Try to talk about this for, for a minute. Oh, Place it. <laughs> oh, oops. I'm just going to undress. You can. can you, okay. I go, ha ha, hurrah. Now I feel like Madonna. Okay. <laughs> okay, so uh, from, there were so many recommendations you can imagine. There was just, it, was, um, it was ridiculous. The report is very good, though, and it is online. Go and have a look. 
But for me, the thing that kept coming up time and time again, again, you know, whatever we, we looked at, is open data, education, and skills. It's not alchemy. It's not difficult. I need my clicker. I need my clicker. Oh. Yes. <laughs> I don't have to do this whole thing all over again, aren't I? Anyway, right. Um, sorry, live stream people. <laughs> I am the comedy act from London. Uh, so open data, education, and skills. Things that you know, we hear people talking about all the time, right? And this really is why, and this is where representative democracy comes in. I don't have enough hands. So in the olden days, what used to happen was that people used to jump on their horses from the villages, and they used to ride to Parliament, and they would bring the wishes of the villagers to Parliament and tell them what everybody wanted, and then they would ride back, and they would say, this is what Parliament is doing, this is what you need to know. That was how representative democracy kind of worked physically. It wasn't a Trojan horse, it was just a normal horse. <laughs> Ish. So this is what I say. Now, we have to forget about the horses, and we need to ride the algorithm. Any geeks in the audience, please don't take me up on this, because I know I've, I've argued this at length. But you know, the, the, the idea is that we need to think about how information moves around on the web in the same way as those horses moved physically around the country. And that, for me, is why open data is important, because it needs to be free, and it needs to go where the people are. And I'm just going to explain open data <laughs> in my way, because it's very difficult to explain it. So, or explaining open data and explaining one of the reasons why it's important to people like my mum. So, you know if you go online and you go shopping for a pair of blue trousers, you may or may not buy those blue trousers for at least the next 24 hours. Those blue trousers are going to follow you around the web, right? Everywhere you go, here's some blue trousers. I already bought my blue trousers. Now imagine that you're really into chickens and you really care about chickens. And something is there is a bill that is going through Parliament which is about to ban the ownership of chickens. And you don't know about this because that data, that information that's in that bill at the moment is not open. It's not available and marked up and all the rest of it for the algorithms to pick them up and take them into your social space. So the lady who is passionate about chickens doesn't know that this thing is going through Parliament, that this bill is going through Parliament at, an at a time when she would be able to engage. If it could move around, like the blue trousers, she would know when she went to write her email or she went onto Facebook, she went to the same, she's got her blue trousers, and she's also got this bill on chickens. So for me, that's why open data is important through the medium of blue trousers and chickens. Millennials. We all talk about these, these kids all the time. But for me, the most important thing that we need to think of as a kind of civic tech group is that these children, especially the ones that have been born in 97 and after, have grown up with social media. What that means is that they can curate their own communities. They grow up expecting to have a community of people around the variety of topics that they're interested in, friends that they may or may not know in real life, and they expect to influence those communities. Not only that, they know how to influence those communities because they know to use the like button or to use the follow button or they need to see how many people have retweeted what they've said. And if people are not reacting to what they've said, they know to change their message very slightly so that they can get a reaction. Now that might be about how to do a smoky eye right now. But in 10 years time, when this is the doctors, when this is the politicians, when this is the care workers, when this is anybody, you know, the thing that they are passionate about, they expect to have their own communities and they expect to influence them. And these kids, if you think about the ones that were born in 97, they are 17 now. Kevin's a little bit old. Sorry, Kevin. So they're just about to come out into the working world. They're just about, around the world, they're just about to take 
jobs and kind of you know go into the beginning of industries and they're going to be breaking it from the bottom up because they have this expectation blank slide this is because everything is changing so quickly right so for the digital democracy commission what is happening next is that um, we are about to publish an implementation plan. We have no right to do this, it's just that the commissioners have said we can't just write a paper that says this is what Parliament should do. We need to actually say, and how, and how will we know if and when you will do this, and if you can't do it, why? Because people can then hold you to account. So obviously this is taking a little bit of time, but we are going to be publishing an implementation plan. Secondly, and this is very exciting, I think, and we have Ben Carlos again to thank for this, the digital democracy brand logo is um, a crown and a long thing. It's nice. And at the launch of the report, me and another commissioner spoke to the speaker to say, can this brand be opened up so that anybody that is producing any bit of tech or running a program or anything that sits within the ethos of the Digital Democracy Commission, can they apply to us to have this brand so that they can use the Digital Democracy Commission brand on their, on their um, whatever it is that they've done? That way, around the world, that way we will all see who is doing what. There are going to be a set of kind of very simple rules for it, but it must be open source. It must be something that other people can reuse and share. So that hopefully all of the democracies around the world who are going to have to kind of step up and move on quite fast can do so without duplicating effort. Now, I was hoping that today we would be, we'd be able to launch it from the stage. But unfortunately, we have to wait for the Queen to approve. So, what we have done, subject to Her Majesty, what we have done is we have created a page which um, I will read out to you and uh, is also going to be um, tweeted, which is rewiredstate.org slash DDC, as in Digital Democracy Commission. On that page you can register interest and then if you want to, as soon as it gets going, then we will um, tell you the process. It will be very simple, trust me. So, those are the two things that are happening with um, Digital Democracy Commission, there is a lot of work to do. But for me, and I think there was a message that came through very strongly yesterday, especially from Jim, but from a lot of people to kind of step up and kind of lead and, and to do all of this. And for me, it's very important that we don't forget that we must all keep to our commitments. So I am committing um, on the stage, my, my company, Rewired State and Young Rewired State, Rewired State, is uh, starting a five-year program called the Data Citizen Project, where we're taking data and we are finding ways to help people make better decisions. We're working with 12 universities. It's a huge program. And you can have a look at that at datacitizen.org. Young Rewired State, I am still finding and fostering all of those kids out there who are driven to teach themselves how to code and introduce them to each other and to the civic tech world so that they can solve real world problems and I'm doing that around the world and I will continue to do that through Young Rewired State. But for me, my personal commitment is actually around young people and making sure that they understand that they can vote, that they have a right to vote and how to vote. Because at the moment what I'm hearing, especially in the UK, is they don't. And so I would like you to think about your commitment, what you can do. It's a very long hashtag, so you can't commit too much. It's easy. But it would be great if you could. And that, you don't have to come on stage, is me. <laughs> Thank you.